reading this morning was from Matthew chapter 1 and 2, and I just want to recap uh, the beginning of Matthew chapter 2 and think about it for a few minutes. Matthew 2, page 966 in the church Bibles, the visit of the wise men or the magi, after Jesus was born in Bethlehem in Judea during the time of King Herod, magi, wise men from the east, came to Jerusalem and asked, Where is the one who has been born King of the Jews? We saw his star in the east and have come to worship him. Now, I don't want to disturb you this morning, but there's only one more sleep before Christmas. And if you're not ready for it, you're not going to be ready for it. Very sorry about that, ladies and gentlemen, but if you were going to send an auntie a Christmas card and you forgot, it's now a New Year card, officially, because the postmen are on holiday. And, uh, you know, I think we go a wee bit crazy with the spending of money and the buying of gifts at Christmas time. It's nice to be kind and to be generous, to give and receive, but we go a bit over, over the top, really. Better even than that is to be generous with our time and to spend time with people over Christmas and over particularly tomorrow to be generous with time for the people we care about and love. So if you've forgotten to buy a gift for somebody, too late. But it doesn't matter. Maybe hearing from you a phone call or something will mean more than receiving those socks. However, there's one thing you mustn't forget to do. If you're having a frozen turkey, take it out the moment you get home. Or it'll be a very, very late lunch tomorrow. The kind of things that we might forget uh, at Christmas time probably don't matter all that much. I mean, if you miss The Great Escape on TV, you already know the story. Um, hopefully you won't forget what uh, the uh, parents of Kevin forgot in the famous film Home Alone, uh, where they flew to Paris for Christmas and left their little boy back in the United States all alone with every thief in Boston trying to rip him off. Uh, so that's Kevin, whose family forgot family at Christmas time. I'm going to show you a picture just now of a, a fairly expensive toy made by Playmobil. You can still get this. I checked about two weeks ago, and on Amazon, they had three of them. I don't know how much you'd be willing to pay for this little plastic nativity set, but it was £79.99 plus four ninety nine postage, which really, that was the bit that got me. <laughs> so none of my children will find this in their stocking tomorrow morning. They're a bit old for Playmobil anyway. Playmobil is great, by the way. It's indestructible. But they, they produce ranges that change, and they produce Christmas ranges. And this particular one has lots of animals in it. It's a sort of animal-based advent calendar, and there's an animal for all the days of Christmas, because it is 80 quid's worth. That's a lot of euros as well. Um, but there's something missing from the Playmobil advent calendar. They've got a star. They've got a stable. They've got a manger. They've got donkeys. They've got pigs and sheep and goats. They've even got geese. And they've even got Father Christmas. I don't remember him being in the Christmas story in, in Matthew or in Luke, but there he is in the Playmobil Advent calendar. But if you've got really good eyes, even up at the back of the gallery, can you see who's missing? Who they forgot to include in their nativity scene? Can you see who's missing? Jesus. 
Yeah, Jesus isn't there. So either they were the folks in Playmobil are very sensitive about the second commandment and not making physical representations of God. Maybe maybe that's the reason. But I suspect they just forgot. They included Santa, but they forgot Jesus. And it is possible that Jesus will be way down in our list of thoughts this Christmas. Tree up, got you. Christmas card sent, got you. One of my friends who lives near Perth put a thing on Facebook the other day apologizing to all her friends and family members whose letters were in the range R to Z because they, were, they weren't getting a card this year. She's a very organized person. She starts with the A's, and she ran out of time. So the Robertsons, sorry, you're not in this year. Maybe next year she'll start with the Z's and work her way the other way. Um, don't miss Jesus out of how you individually and as a family remember this Christmas season. Matthew in chapter 1 says a number of interesting things about Jesus that root him as a historical person, someone real, someone who really lived. There's his family tree. It acts as his introduction to us, like his CV. If you've ever had to write a CV, maybe going for a job, you'll say where you were educated, where you were born, what your skills are, what your interests are, what your work experience is, why they should give you the job. And Matthew says, here is the CV for Jesus, the Son of God. This is the reason why he is qualified to be the Savior of the world. And he lists his qualifications beginning with his family tree. So unlike a mythical figure or a figure of legend, Jesus is someone rooted in a family. And he is the son of David. He is uh, of the royal household and line of the people of Israel and Judah. He has a claim to the throne of Israel. And he is the promised Savior King whom God centuries before said would come. If you look at the CV, if you look at Matthew 1, it's very obvious that Jesus is a real person, a real human being. He's got a real mother. Joseph, don't be afraid to take Mary home as your wife. She's conceived. And that's what human mothers do. And what's conceived in her is from the Holy Spirit. The baby that she has, this human baby growing within her, is specially created by God's Holy Spirit. She will give birth to a son, a human. And you are to give him the name Jesus, meaning Savior because he will save his people from their sins. So he's the Savior in Matthew 1, verse 21. And he's also the one who fulfills the promises from the Old Testament that God would be with his people. And you get that in Matthew 1, verse 23. The prophet said, One day Emmanuel will come, a virgin will give birth to a child, and they'll call him Emmanuel, which means God is with us. I suppose before Jesus was born, everybody thought that was just Old Testament poetry, that it was just a, an image, a figure of speech, a, a metaphor. Oh yeah, a, a great leader will arrive, a great king will arrive, and God will be so with him God will so favor the king, God will so favor the house and line of David that it will be as if God was with us. But when Jesus was born, it turns out it's not just an image with words. It's not just poetry. It's not just a figure of speech. It really is God stepping into this world because Mary's son, a real human, is also God's Son, conceived by the Holy Spirit of God, God and man. It blows your mind. It's never happened before. It will never happen again. That's the story Matthew tells. 
And then he draws breath and he says, what must I tell you next? He could have told us lots of things. He was being selective. But the Christmas story that Matthew chooses to tell us emphasizes the visit of wise men. I wonder why. Well, I'm going to try and tell you. I think there are three things in the story of the wise men that will help us to remember Jesus Christ this Christmas and not to miss him out of our Christmas celebration. And the first thing is this, that the gift we need at Christmas is a king. The wise men traveled from somewhere in the Orient, somewhere far east of the Holy Land. They had seen a star. They had tried to understand the heavens. And perhaps because Jewish people had gone to the east, some of them had been in Babylon, in what we would call Iraq today. Some of them had been as far away as Iran, even India, through the history of the Jewish people. The Bible and the Word of God and the promises and the prophecies of the Word of God would have gone east with these people. And somehow the wise men became aware that the time for the Savior, the King, the Messiah to be born had arrived. And it was confirmed when they studied the sky and something weird was happening in the sky that made them start journeying towards Jerusalem. They were convinced by what they knew from prophecies, what they knew from what they'd studied and read in books, and what they saw when they studied the sky. They knew God was on the move, and a great king was coming, and they wanted to be in on that. And God is interested in the welfare of the nations and all the peoples of the earth. And God, when he rolled out a red carpet for his own son to arrive in this world, he was also rolling out a red carpet for the nations and the peoples of the earth to come into the kingdom of God under the leadership of a king, Jesus. So look again at what the wise men say. They arrive in Judea. They've traveled. We don't know how many wise men there were. They, they brought three gifts. So it's likely there were at least three of them, but maybe there were more than three of them. And they arrive, and they do the natural thing. They go to the palace of King Herod in Jerusalem. And they inquire there, and they say, Where is the one who has been born king of the Jews? We saw a star in the east, and have come to worship him. Why did Matthew tell us this story? Because Matthew wants us to get this. Whatever else we forget this Christmas, it would be a shame to forget the food. But you could survive Christmas without overeating. It would be a shame to forget the Christmas TV. But even Doctor Who, you'll get it on iPlayer next week if you miss it on Monday. But don't miss this. Where is the one who has been born king, not just of the Jews, but king of everyone? Where's the king? That's the reason Matthew includes this story. He wants everyone who hears about the birth of Jesus to think there's a king, there's a new king. And the thing God considers we need at Christmas time is someone to follow, someone to rule over us and love us and lead us. The gift we need is a king. Some gifts that we get at Christmas time are not totally welcome. Now, I'm hoping, I'm hoping that there'll be a wee stocking for me tomorrow with something in it. I don't know. We're doing Secret Santa in the family this year. So uh, in a sense, it's a one-shot thing. There's going to be one present, and it'll either be a roaring success or it'll be one of those, yeah, I love it. <laughs> eBay. <laughs> That's the way it works with, with, with gifting. We, we can get it really right or we can get it really wrong. But if five of your friends all buy you 
a dieting book. There's a message coming through. If you get five DVDs from your friends and your family members, all with a title, Overcoming Selfishness for Dummies, there's a message coming through. Some gifts are not really all that welcome. Here's a subscription to the High Life Gym. Are you kidding me? What gift has God given us by providing a king? Well, Isaiah said, the people sitting in darkness have seen a great light. We're in the dark. And we need a king to lead us out of the dark. We don't like thinking we're in the dark about the meaning of life and why we're here and, and our purpose. But if Jesus is the light of the world and if he's the king, we're in the dark. And there are so many other ways in which Matthew and the other gospel writers tell us uncomfortable things by describing the gift of God when he sent his son. He's described as a savior. Call him Jesus. Joseph and Mary didn't choose that name. Now, I'm sure that Annie and Mark chose the name for their little boy, Ethan, and for their little girl, Grace Lillian. They chose the name because parents get to choose the name of their children. But Jesus, his human parents, his legal father Joseph, his real mother Mary, they didn't choose the name. God chose the name. It's as if God is saying, this baby doesn't depend on you. You depend on this baby, and you're going to call him Savior because you need saving. And you need saving by a leader that you will follow, a king. So the word gets to the palace, God's gift on the first Noel, the gift we need is a king. Why? Because all the other kings are rubbish. And all the other kingdoms are rubbishy. And God has to set up his own kingdom because without God's rule, we're in a mess. The second gift that God gives in the birth of his son is that he tells us this king is a king that must be accepted. The king we need, the king who came that first Christmas, can be pushed away, can be rejected, but Matthew and Luke are telling us about people who said yes to the kingdom of God and the king God sent. The wise men said yes. Mary said yes. In the opening verses of John chapter 1, we're told that Jesus came to his own people, but his own people didn't want to know him. But to all who did receive him, to all who did accept him, he gave the right to become the children of God. So there's a thing about Christmas where we can push God away. We can take the outward Christmassy stuff, the tinsel and trees, and we can push the heart of it away that God is giving us a king who must rule over us and be boss of our lives. So the king is the gift we need. And the king we need must be accepted. Did King Herod accept him? Well, let's read verse 3. When King Herod heard, that, heard the, what the wise men said, when King Herod heard this, he was disturbed. I don't think disturbed really does justice to it. He blew a gasket. And all Jerusalem with him. Jerusalem was disturbed because Herod was disturbed. Now the wise men weren't totally wise because I don't think they realized how angry and disturbed King Herod was. I'm not sure that they had what we today call emotional intelligence. Because they're busy speaking to King Herod whose reputation was that he had killed two of his own sons in case they became a threat and a rival to him and took the throne off him. 
This is a man who has rubbed out his own children to cling to his scabby throne. And our, our, a bunch of foreigners turn up saying, we've heard the new king of the Jews has been born. We wonder, your majesty, if you could show, show us the way. And Herod is disturbed. So he says to them, oh yeah, I'd love, I'd love to worship the new king as well. The wise men didn't quite get the gesture. Something was lost in translation. Later, warned by God, they understood the character of Herod and they went home without going back to the palace. Herod didn't accept the new king. He ordered the destruction of all baby boys born in the Bethlehem area up to the age of two. Nobody really knows how many baby boys were killed. Um, Herod killed a lot of people. He was a ruthless, awful king. Some of the historians guess that between 30 and 60, Bethlehem was a small place. But nobody really knows. But in a sense, these little boys were martyrs for the kingdom of the Lord Jesus Christ. And Joseph and Mary had to take Jesus away down to Egypt to be safe from Herod until Herod himself had died. Not everyone welcomed, not everyone accepted that the one promised by God centuries before would be their king. Think about the leaders of the Jewish people, the people who are described there in verse 5. Herod called the chief priests and the teachers of the law, and he asked them where the Messiah, where the Christ, where the, the king was to be born. And they have no hesitation. Verse 5, in Bethlehem in Judea, for this is what the prophet has written, you, Bethlehem, in the land of Judah, you are by no means least among the rulers of Judah, the clans of Judah, for out of you will come a ruler, a king, who will be the shepherd of my people, Israel. The people who knew the Bible were expecting the great Savior King to be born in Bethlehem. And here are a bunch of foreigners saying, we've come because we're convinced the new king has been born. Did any of them go to Bethlehem? No. How far was it from Jerusalem to Bethlehem? Five, six, seven can't quite get that one straight. Eight, eight miles. Eight miles. None of the scribes, none of the priests, none of the temple people went to see if there was a Messiah born in Bethlehem. And Herod didn't go himself. He certainly didn't go to worship. He just sent swords. He sent men to kill the baby boys in Bethlehem. Here's the thing. Will our response to Jesus be any better than that of Herod? Will we welcome the king God has sent? Will we accept him? Or will we hurry on with our own Christmas without him? So we've seen the gift we need is a king. The king we need must be accepted. The wise men worshipped him. But the last thing is that the king we need must be treasured. I love the way Luke tells us that Mary treasured everything in her heart about the promise of Jesus. And the wise men who traveled so far followed their star. When the star guided them to the place where the child was to be born, they too were overjoyed. Verse 9 um, they went on their way, and the star they'd seen in the east went ahead of them until it stopped over the place where the child was. Verse 10, when they saw the star, they were overjoyed. On coming to the house, they saw the child with his mother Mary. They bowed down and worshipped him. They treasured the child Jesus. He may have been more than a baby by this stage. He may have been up and walking. He may have been a toddler. We don't really know how old Jesus was. And they opened their treasures and presented him with gifts of gold and of incense and of myrrh. The gold, the frankincense, the myrrh. Gold for a king. 
incense, frankincense, what you burn during a time of prayer in the temple, the smell that goes up, the aroma that goes to heaven, gold for a king, incense for God, and myrrh, the stuff you save up for a dead body when someone's gone. What insight the wise men had into Jesus that he was a king and that he was God as well as man and that he would die for the salvation of the world. That's how he would be a savior. The wise men seem to have been on the right channel. They seem to have been tuning in to the right vibrations because their gifts suggest that they treasured the reality of King Jesus as the one born to save, born to rescue, born to lead, born to rule, born to die. They treasured Jesus, and they didn't go back to the palace. They went all the way home. Now, what's the difference between a gift and a treasure? I receive gifts, and I'm pretty confident that there'll be two or three tomorrow. And maybe some of them will become treasures, things that I will hang on to for years and years, maybe for the rest of my life. There might be something that a child has produced, and years later, you still treasure it. I received in the post a few weeks ago a bit of artwork from little Matthew Trounce. He hadn't finished it. He wanted me to finish it. But coloring in. I haven't finished it yet, Matthew, if you're listening from Australia. Get to bed soon. It's nearly Christmas. But how nice. So it's on my fridge and I see it every day. It's a little treasure. Because a very loving little boy sent it halfway around the world. I wear a wedding ring. It's not worth a lot. But it symbolizes the day we got married and the gift that we gave to each other. I gave myself to my wife. She gave herself to me. And these little wedding bands, they're treasures. I, I would hate to lose it. Because it's a treasure. This Christmas, treasure the Son of God Give him ultimate value. Because without him, what are you left with? Brussels sprouts and red cabbage. And they're fine. But they're not treasure. I'm going to finish with another picture. This is a, a guy. You can Google this guy if you like. Let's get the next slide up, boys. This is a man called Andy Park. Has anyone heard of Andy Park? called Mr. Christmas. You're not reading the Daily Express enough if you haven't come across Andy Park. Google him. He's nuts. I hope he doesn't sue me for saying that. Andy Park lives in Wiltshire in England, and since the early 1990s, he has celebrated Christmas every day. He tried to give it up a couple of years ago, and he gave it up for about two weeks. But apart from that two-week period, he has had the turkey dinner and the gravy and the Brussels sprouts and uh, all the really bad stuff, the brandy, uh, the mince pies, and uh, all of that every day since the early 1990s. He is now 19 stones. He's single not really surprised about that. He watches the Queen's speech with a sherry every day. Must get a bit boring. Because that's not Christmas. He's on his own with his tree. He's, he's worn out 30 artificial trees. And his neighbors must think he's nuts. And he sends himself Christmas cards bad enough that you have to send them to other people, but to send yourself a Christmas card, Andy Park doesn't have a clue what Christmas is about. Pity him. But do I have a clue? Do you have a clue what Christmas is all about? 
Christmas is about God giving you a leader, a king, whom we are invited, commanded to accept. Jesus, I will follow you as my Lord and my God. And Jesus, I will love you. And Jesus, I will treasure you because you gave yourself to be my Savior 2,000 years ago. I wish you a very happy Christmas. And if Jesus is your king, it will be. God bless you. Father in heaven, thank you for this morning, for the songs and the readings and for the message of Christ the king. If he is a king, there must be a kingdom, and that kingdom will never end. If there is a kingdom, there must be men and women and young people who are subjects of the king. We ask that we may be found in the kingdom of your Christ, that we may follow him. Lord, help us to welcome and to accept the king and to treasure him. Amen.